Welcome to Macro Monday on Investec Focus Radio SA, a podcast about what's driving global and local markets. I'm Chris Holdsworth, Chief Investment Strategist at Investec Wealth and Investment. Every Monday morning, I'll update you on key developments from the past week and what you need to know about the week ahead. If you'd prefer to watch a video with the graphs and charts I referred to in the podcast, just go to investec.com forward slash Macro Monday. Good morning. This week, we'll have a look at a disconnect in the U.S. economic data. We'll have a look at the extent to which has been a rebound in Chinese economic activity over the past month or so. We'll have a look at what's happening with regards to shipping through the Suez Canal and Panama Canal and what that implies for global inflation. And finally, we'll have a look at the South African CPI print that came out last week. We're going to start off with U.S. economic data. The conference board publishes a leading indicator on a monthly basis. Typically, it gives us a good steer for where the U.S. economy is going to go. There's a very long relationship between this series and GDP growth. It was down again last month for the 23rd month in a row. That's close to a record. The record was set during the the GFC, the global financial crisis. And if one looks at that leading indicator series, it's down materially year on year, down materially over the past six months. It's normally at this sort of level that you would expect the U.S. to be in recession. Now, clearly, the U.S. is not in recession. It hasn't been in recession in the last year. It's been quite far away from a recession. So there is a disconnect between what the leading indicator is suggesting with regards to the economy and the actual GDP numbers that we're seeing. And there's a disconnect, too, between what the GDP data is saying and the PMI data. And the PMI data is typically the most timeless estimate of economic activity, and it's pointing to a material slowdown in the U.S. We would have expected the U.S. to have had very weak growth over the past year based solely on the PMI data, and that hasn't transpired. So there's a disconnect building between the GDP data and the leading indicator, and there's a disconnect building between the GDP data and the PMI data. And it's a bit difficult to resolve at this point. But even more than that, there's a disconnect between between GDP and GDI, gross domestic income. And typically those series are close as well. So it's going to take a little while to resolve which of these series are correct. But in the meantime, it's that GDP data that's come out stands out as being quite anomalous relative to the other data series that we typically look at to give us a steer for where the U.S. economy is going. Now, the consensus has shifted away from a recession in the U.S. The consensus estimate at this point is that there's only a 45 percent chance of recession in the U.S. in the next 12 months or so. That's well below the forecast sort of around about eight to nine months ago, where the consensus view was that the U.S. was extremely likely to go into recession. So that recession probability has declined as those GDP numbers have been very strong. It's not the same story in Europe. At the moment, the consensus forecast is that there's about a 75% chance of recession in Germany, about a 65% chance in Italy, and a 60% chance of Europe in aggregate going into recession. So we have seen this gap open up between Europe and the US, whereas previously they were expected to have similar probabilities of recession. Now there's quite a sizable difference. Even though the consensus estimate of the probability of recession in the U.S. over the next 12 months has dropped to below 50 percent, there's still a range of indicators suggesting that a slowdown is likely to occur and is already starting now. This is one of them. This chart shows credit card delinquencies for all banks in the U.S. and for small banks separately. And what we can see is that credit card delinquency for all banks is well above pre-COVID levels. And for smaller banks, so banks outside of the top 100, it's now sitting at the highest level that we've seen in around 30 years or so. So pressures are building ultimately as a result of the Fed hiking rates very aggressively. And we'd expect that to continue to play out with the resultants slow in economic activity, even if a recession may be avoided. What does the Fed think about this? Well, last week we got the latest iteration of the FOMC minutes, and the Fed still thinks very clearly that it's too soon to be cutting rates, but they are starting to consider the pace at which they reduce the size of their balance sheet. Now, QE was the Fed ramping up its balance sheet. QT was the Fed reducing the size of its balance sheet. They've done so at a fairly aggressive pace, and now they're just beginning to wonder if they should start to slow in that regard. And Ultimately, in our view, slowing the pace of QT would mean that bond yields in the U.S. would come down. That would be very helpful for global fixed income, very helpful for SA fixed income too. We are overweight fixed income, both globally and domestically, in anticipation of a slowdown in growth, and this would just be another reason.
Switching to China, we've seen some early data with regards to the Chinese New Year season and the travel that we've seen in China. And the early data has been very strong, up around about 60% year on year or so. If you look at the number of visitors to Macau, it's now roughly in line with pre-COVID levels. So we have seen this massive surge in travel over the past few months or so, but particularly lately. And that tells us that there is a rebound underway in Chinese economic activity. We have spoken about this before, about very low inflation in China leading to more stimulus, more stimulus leading to a rebound. It's just the beginning of that. If we look at leading indicators for China in contrast to what we're seeing for the US, they do suggest that that rebound is likely to continue to be quite strong over the coming six to, to 12 months or so. Switching to China, we have seen some very strong initial data with regards to the tourism season in China. If you look at the number of visitors to Macau, as an example, is back in line with pre-COVID levels. If you look at the number of people taking trains, typically traveling around the country, that's up around 60% year on year. And there are a few other tourism indicators that are also up around 50 to 60% year on year. So there has been a clear rebound in Chinese economic activity of late. We've expected that for some time. There are leading indicators that suggest this is likely to continue for the next six to 12 months or so. And ultimately, this stems from very low inflation in China, which is allowing for stimulus. And we're now starting to see that gain traction and we'd expect Chinese economic activity to continue to be strong over the coming six to 12 months or so. That's not to say China is completely out of the woods. House prices were down again last month, and this has been an issue in China. We've seen the defaults for the Chinese home developer space. This is something we'll have to keep a close eye on. But bear in mind that the rest of China appears to be, or certainly the domestic component of Chinese growth seems to be picking up quite aggressively of late. Global transit is still facing some issues. If you look at the number of ships going through the Suez Canal and through the Panama Canal, they're both down materially of late. And we're just starting to see what that means for global shipping prices. They're up around about 100% year on year. Typically, there's a lag between increases in shipping prices and goods price inflation. In the US, the lag's about four months or so. But now we've had this issue for a couple of months. And we've just now started to see it reflected in import prices in the US. And within a month or two's time, we'd likely see that reflected in goods prices in the US as well. So we'll have to keep a very close eye on, on these series. It does appear that it's persisting and it's already likely to start to have an impact on global inflation and US goods price inflation in particular within the next month or two. Switching to South Africa, but sticking with inflation, the latest SA inflation numbers came out last week. Inflation surprised mildly on the downside. 5.3% uh, versus the consensus of 5.4. We do expect a fuel price increase at the beginning of next month, the order of about 80 cents per litre or so. We plug that with a few other factors into our model, and we expect that South African inflation will remain at and around current levels until around at least June. We expect that inflation will only really start to meaningfully drop off from around about August or so. So we're likely to see the MPC still continue to be conservative for some time, just as the Fed is being as well. And that's where we're gonna leave it for this week. That's all for this episode. Do you tune in next week for more investment insights from me, Chris Holdsworth, and the Investec Wealth and Investment team. If you haven't yet added us to your podcast feed, you can subscribe to Investing Focus Radio SA wherever you listen. And please take a minute to rate our podcast so we can surface this content to the broader investment community. If you want to see the graphs that are referenced in the podcast, you can watch a video version of this recording at investing.com forward slash macro monday. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of Investec Wealth and Investment International and should not be taken as advice, guidance, or recommendation. Investec Wealth and Investment International, a member of the JSE Equity, Equity Derivatives, Currency Derivatives, Bond Derivatives, and Interest Rate Derivatives Markets, an authorized financial services provider and a registered credit provider.